you are doing well. It's about time for us to begin. We've just got a few more Wednesday nights in the study of the book of Esther, and then we'll get started with our, um, our summer series in the sum, uh, for the summer. So I'm, you want to know that schedule, you can look on the board in the education wing, uh, or if you'd like to pick up the flyers out in the, um, uh, the uh, exit tower, you can look there as well, and you can get a list of the topics, our theme, our speakers, and all of that. So let's have a word of prayer, and then we'll get started. Father, we are grateful to you for everything you do for us. We are grateful for this day and this opportunity uh, before us to gather together to uh, mutually study your word, uh, to continue to have our faith renewed and to be encouraged uh, and to be motivated to continue to live faithfully for you in in any and all circumstances, no matter what they may be. Uh, We thank you for individuals like Mordecai and, and Esther, whose faithfulness, whose courage, Uh, continue to shine through in in circumstances that just seem impossible to overcome. And we uh, we pray that that will remind us that there are things that are impossible to us and for us, but with you all things are possible. And we pray that we will lean on that truth and rely on that uh, for the rest of our days. Be with us for the rest of this class, and uh, we pray that you bless our time in Jesus' name. Amen. So I actually want to just do a quick recap from last week. And then I want us to look at a, a psalm uh, that goes that would tie into this. So when we left off last week, if you were able to be with us, what has Haman accomplished so far? What has he been able to do uh, to the Jewish people? Just give me a quick recap. What's he been able to do? Okay, get a law enacted, an edict enacted to where it's just going to destroy them. It's going to annihilate them. What kind of man have we discovered uh, is Haman. What kind of individual is he? Proud. Okay, proud. Self-centered. Okay. Angry. Angry. What did you say, Susan? Spiteful. Spiteful. Very spiteful. Uh, all of these are true, and then there's so much more. We're just not having a lot of time uh, to really go into that. And then when it specifically had come to Mordecai, what had he planned for Mordecai? Okay, death, and it was immediate. Even though it, the, the decree had put Mordecai under that, he just couldn't wait. So he's, he, he wants to put him to death now. So what does Haman build? Gallo. Uh, and hopefully I'll be able to dig up a picture for you. Kind of think of a gallo. My, my mind kind of came with the French, and you, you got the blade that comes down, or you think of something else. But most would believe that it's just this big, long, I'm just going to call it a spear, uh, and it's about 75 foot tall. Who is going to get up there and throw Mordecai from the top down? Uh, that, there's not a lot of thought through uh, all of this, but just to show you the spitefulness that he wants all of this to happen. So he has this built, uh, and that's where we left off. So before we get into chapter 6, I actually want us to look at Psalm 37. Because there's something that's going to provide, it, it's going to provide an interlude for us. And kind of just, if, if you're leaving chapter 5, if you're Mordecai, if you're Esther, if you're the Jewish nation, there's just no way out from any of this. It just really looks like evil is going to win. Spitefulness is going to win. Anger is going to win. Self-centeredness is going to win. That it just There's nothing that we can do. We're hopeless. We're helpless. And I want to look at Psalm 37 because there are going to be times in our life where Obviously, we face Satan every day, but people are going to set themselves up against us, whether that's individually, whether that's with our families, whether that's us as a group, uh, as, as a church. That's going to happen. And I want to read Psalm 37, so we're going to take the time to read it, and I want to highlight a few things. Because what do we do when we find ourselves in a position like that, with, with, uh, with a Haman? Uh, with someone who's, who's just being spiteful, someone who has made it their, uh, by all appearances on our end, has made it their mission to just make our lives miserable, uh, to make us public enemy number one. How do we respond? What do we do? So let's read Psalm 37 and look at a few things from here, and then with the rest of the time, we'll look at Esther chapter 6. Fret not yourself because of evildoers. Be not envious of wrongdoers. 
For they will soon fade like the grass and wither like the green herb. Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and befriend faithfulness. Delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust in him and he will act. He will bring forth your righteousness as the light and your justice as the noonday. Be still before the Lord and wait patiently for him. Fret not yourself over the one who prospers in his way, over the man who carries out evil devices. Refrain from anger and forsake wrath. Fret not yourself, it tends only to evil. For the evildoers shall be cut off, but those who wait for the Lord shall inherit the land. In just a little while, the wicked will be no more. Though you look carefully at his place, he will not be there. But the meek shall inherit the land and delight themselves in abundant peace. The wicked plots against the righteous and gnashes his teeth at him. But the Lord laughs at the wicked, for he sees that his day is coming. The wicked draw the sword and bend their bows to bring down the poor and the needy, to slay those whose way is upright. Their sword shall enter their own heart, and their bows shall be broken. Better is a little that the righteous has than the abundance of many wicked. For the arms of the wicked shall be broken, but the Lord upholds the righteous. The Lord knows the days of the blameless, and their heritage will remain forever. They are not put to shame in evil times, and in the days of famine they have abundance. But the wicked will perish. The enemies of the Lord are like the glory of the pastures. They vanish like smoke. They vanish away. The wicked borrows, but does not pay back. But the righteous is generous and gives. For those blessed by the Lord, blessed by the Lord, shall inherit the land, but those cursed by him shall be cut off. The steps of a man are established by the Lord when he delights in his way. Though he fall, he shall not be cast headlong, for the Lord upholds his hand. I've been young, and now I'm old, yet I've not seen the righteous forsaken or his children begging for bread. He is ever lending generously, and his children become a blessing. Turn away from evil and do good, so you shall dwell forever. For the Lord loves justice. He will not forsake his saints. They are preserved forever, but the children of the wicked shall be cut off. The righteous shall inherit the land and dwell upon it forever. The mouth of the righteous utters wisdom. And his tongue speaks justice. The law of his God is on his heart, and his steps do not slip. The wicked watch for the righteous and seeks to put him to death. The Lord will not abandon him to his power and let him be condemned when he is brought to trial. Wait for the Lord and keep his way, and he will exalt you to inherit the land. You will look on when the wicked are cut off. I have seen a wicked and ruthless man spreading himself like a green laurel tree. But he passed away, and behold, he was no more. Though I sought him, he could not be found. Mark the blameless, and behold the upright, for there is a future for the man of peace. But transgressors shall be altogether destroyed, and the future of the wicked shall be cut off. The salvation of the righteous is from the Lord. He is their stronghold in the time of trouble. The Lord helps them and delivers them. He delivers them from the wicked and saves them because they take refuge. So the whole psalm is really a contrast between the wicked and the righteous. Uh, It's it's just an amazing contrast that is there. I'm not going to take it uh, verse by verse, but I do want to highlight a few questions and highlight a few things from those questions. So three times in in this psalm, in verse 1 and and in verse 7 and in verse 8, he says, fret not yourself. Three times he says to fret not yourself. Somebody put that in layman's terms. What's he telling them? Don't worry. Now that's a pretty tall task for a moment. Just think for a moment. As this psalm kind of describes the wicked, how powerful and how influential are the wicked? What what does it appear that they can do in this psalm? Okay? By all appearances, it's whatever they want to do. It can do anything. They're pretty powerful. And the psalmist says, fret not yourself. Three times, fret not yourself. Fret not yourself. Fret. Don't worry about it. And the whole point of the psalm is, well, why, can't, why, why not worry about it? 
What's the evidence that I have? What is there for me to not to worry? When someone sets themselves up or someone's, a group of people, set themselves up against God's people or whatever it may be, again, fill in the blank. How do I not fret myself? How do I not allow it to get the best of me? So, one thing that I want to highlight, and I need you to look at it, and you can look at it briefly if you want, but I got the verses up there. Verse 2, verse 9, verse 20, verse 22, verse 28, verses 35 and 36, and verse 38. You need to take a quick look at all of those, go ahead. But what do we learn about the wicked according to this? They'll perish. There's something about that. So put it in another word. Give me another word for that. The wicked are temporary. Don't fret yourself because the wicked are temporary. Whether it's a pasture, a passing glory of a pasture, whether it's just something that they're just dust and a wind, it doesn't really matter. There's something that you need to know about those who live wickedly. You need to know something, whether they're individuals, whether they are groups, whatever it is, there is something that you need to know. There's something you must be reminded of. Whoever is classified as the wicked, they are temporary. How does that help us to not fret? It helps us. Okay. All right, if they're temporary, they don't win. Now, they may win a battle or two. They may gain the upper hand for a little while. But in the end, they don't win anything. And I want you to think for a moment. And, I, and I'm just kind of overlaying it. I'm not saying this is what Mordecai is doing. But have you noticed how Mordecai and Esther have remained calm? I'm not saying that they're not panicking. There's a sense of urgency. But everything that is written about their responses to the news, even though Mordecai rips his clothes and he laments and he mourns, and that's proper, have you noticed that they seem to be calm and cool and collective in being able to come up with a plan, follow through with a plan? Yes, there's fasting. Yes, there's faith. But have you noticed that? Is it possible that as they are looking back and remembering Mordecai especially, the stories how many wicked people have God's people up to this point met and overcome? Quite a few. Doesn't matter if you go back to Abraham and who he had to deal with, or to Egypt and who had the nation had to deal with, or who they had to deal with after the Red Sea. Every enemy, individually or collectively, that set themselves up against God's people gained the upper hand for a little while. And by the way, a little while for it, for Israel and Egypt was how long? There's a, I mean, we got to, a little while isn't five minutes from now. A little while is, a little while, I mean, Potiphar's wife gained the upper hand and his life was dictated by that. But the wicked are temporary. I know that we look at things and people saying things, doing things to us again individually, or we look at it societal, and we're, we're nervous, we're scared. The wicked are temporary. Whatever that is, the wicked are temporary. Now, now we can get proactive. In verse 3 and verse 4 and verse 5, what are the three responses? It actually sets itself up for really good devotional. And for any men who are going to be preaching, it sets itself up for a really good sermon. You just got a three-point three, three point sermon right here in three, four, and five. But what, what are they? What are the three responses? And we're going to look at other responses. But if you are the righteous, if you are the saint of God, and you know the wicked are temporary, but right now they may have the upper hand, and they're going to look like they're overpowering you, it doesn't mean that you are utterly or completely helpless or hopeless. So what are the three things that the that the psalmist says. Okay, so I see a trust. What else do you see? Okay, so there's a verse 3, it's trust. Uh, Doris, you said, and then delight, and then Miss Carol, I think you just said commit. Okay, so notice, trust in the Lord. 
delight in the Lord, commit to the Lord. And then everything else is kind of filler if you wanted a sermon. Why those three responses? Why trust? Why delight? Why commit in the face of wickedness and evildoers? Why are those the responses? Okay. And and really, so even though I have it up here as a wicked versus the righteous, it's really the wicked against God. And it's it's a battle of wills and power, and ultimately God is the one who over, always prevails. Yes. Okay, that's a great point. Okay, so delighting, and the psalmist mentions that in Psalm 1, to meditate, to delight in the law of God. Uh, and notice, oh, how do I know that I'm trusting? Outwardly, I'm doing good. If the inward is the trust, the outward is to do good. How do I know that I'm delighting? This is what, um, what Andy's talking about. How do I know that I'm focused on the Lord? Then what I would desire ends up happening, whatever that may be. It may look different in the way that it is, but it happens. Well, how do I know that I've committed to the Lord? Well, I, it's circular. I'm trusting. And I'm going to continue to do good. You've noticed this. Those are the three responses. So when something, when bad is happening, when evil is happening, we don't, we can, there's a time to lament, there's a time to mourn, and then there's a time to get up. There's a time to trust, there's a time to delight, and it's a time to commit. Go ahead, Ms. Lord. Okay. Okay. No, and that's a really, really good point, and it's fascinating. You quote this uh, Psalm forty-six, well, very well-known verse in verse ten, but it's a great segue into this next one. According to verse seven, and according to verse nine. And according to verse 34, what are the, what's the next response? What is the theme that you see in those three verses? Wait. Wait and know that he is going to wait patiently. Be still before the Lord. So verse 7, wait patiently for him. Fret not yourself over the one who prospers in his way, over the man who carries out evil devices. Go ahead. Okay, so you rest. I mean, it takes on a different connotation. Either way, to be at rest, to be still, is to not be nervous. It's not to be panicking. It's not to be pacing back and forth. It's not to be whatever we would talk about on the internal struggle. Think about these responses in the face of all of this, because we're going to have our own moment. That's one of the things we've been talking about. We will have our own moment where we will have to face wickedness and we will have to face evil and we will have to face the unknown. and We will have to face all of these other things. When that happens, the way that we resist the temptation of pulling within ourselves and excluding everybody else and pulling away from God is that we've committed to him. We've delighted in him. We're trusting in him. We're waiting on him. We're waiting for him. We're doing all of these things that these are responses. And then verses 30 and 31, what's a response? Wisdom and justice. We see wisdom and justice. The mouth of the righteous utters wisdom. His tongue speaks justice. The law of his God is in his hearts. His steps don't slip. Why a, that's a unique way to respond to things. Why is that? You brought this up? You get the first crack at it.
It's the taking the deep breath, and it's using the, and again, it's not just common sense, even though that, that can come in for the believer or the one who's walking, but it's here's what I do know. You know, here's three things I know, two things I know. Here's the next thing I can do. What else makes this an appropriate response? Okay. And look, and it's, it's amazing with that, the law of his God is on his heart. Whatever's on the heart is then ultimately going to control speech and it's going to control what's done in terms of justice. Whatever's in the heart is ultimately going to be controlling the rest of life. And I think someone very wise said that in the New Testament, that what comes out of a man's heart is the indicator of who he is. Well, if there's fret, if there's fear, if there is me committing to uncertainty, if there is me whatever, fill in the blank, then that's going to come out in my language. And that's going to come out in the decisions I make, in the thickness of that. But if the law of the Lord is on my heart, if I've taken the time to delight within it in the ways that I should, then it, when it's time, it'll come out. And do we not see Mordecai doing this? When Esther is, when she is in chapter 4, when she's just not sure, look, the king hasn't called me, I, I haven't seen him for 30 days, I don't know if I can do this, etc., etc. What is Mordecai? What is his language? What are his words of wisdom to encourage her to do acts of justice? Where's his heart? And where did he get that from? Is that just from every day? Or was his, his focus on... It comes out. Inevitably, the heart can be masked in so many different ways. But inevitably, this is what makes trials, periods of darkness, suffering, whatever we want to... This is why uh, Jeff's not here, but why Peter says this is the fire. Fire just doesn't refine Fire reveals what's there all along. And if at some point my language and my decision making in the middle of all of that, fill in the blank, it's going to reveal what this has been filled with. So think about how amazing it is that Mordecai in the midst of captivity has been hiding God's word within his heart. Every day I would assume with that law. Uh, whether he had a copy or not, we know he's getting it. And when the time comes to give his adoptive daughter that boost, this righteous individual who's got to go and no one else can go, but she's got to go. He speaks words of wisdom on his mouth. He is the embodiment, Mordecai. He is the mouth of the righteous that utters wisdom time and time and time again. To ask her. In the middle of this wickedness, in the middle of this spitefulness, this is who she is. And what's amazing about all of this is that you fast forward to Jesus and he's facing the ultimate wickedness. How many times does he utter words of wisdom, even on the cross itself? Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. I thirst. It is finished. How many times does he speak words of wisdom? Even in the midst of his trials and his tests. This is, I just wanted to give you this. Because at the end of chapter 5, if you're Mordecai, if you're Esther, you're hoping for the best, but you're expecting the worst. And you have no idea how things are going to turn out. Unless you trust, you delight, you commit. Unless... The word of the Lord is hidden in your heart, like we just read. In verse 7, verse 9, verse 34, if you will be still, and if you will wait on the Lord. And what do we see Esther doing? How long does she wait to put her plan into motion? Three days. How can she wait? How does she learn to wait? In that? We asked that last week. Is it possible? 
that there was something of the principles of Psalm 37. Is that possible? Possible for them. It's very possible for us. So we're going to get to Esther 6, but anything you'd add? Uh, any, any comments, observations? Go ahead. Ah, great point. Great point. I, yeah. Yeah. No, great. Great observations with that. You're right. It, and time just didn't allow it to really give the study to what a stronghold was for them. Uh, but you, you're right. It was, it was equal forces meeting. But if you were, if it was unequal, if you did, if you had less, or if you were overpowered, you knew you could retreat to a stronghold. Um, and that great, great um, analogy that Esther retreats to fasting, to prayer. And she ropes in all the others to do so with her. And she's not in a hurry to get out of that stronghold. But three days seems to be enough for her to muster whatever it is. So she's still got to go back out. Go ahead. It is. And how else does that happen unless, obviously, his own doing, but the Lord is going to, be, is going to intervene in that own way. Um, the point of this exercise was to put yourself, we may not be facing gallows, but we're facing a lot of different things. The point is, is to not be overcome with the power, the temporary power of the wicked. Whoever the wicked are right now, whatever face, whatever name, whatever ideology, whatever it is that's coming to your, your forefront of your mind, to not be overwhelmed with it, to not be fret, uh, worried and overwhelmed with fret. They are temporary. And in the meantime, you trust, you commit, you delight. You wait. Wait patiently. You know who your God is. You know what He's going to do. And that's, that's what happens. But you still got to face it. And that leaves us uh, to Esther 6. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. Yeah. They, they leave that. Uh, and, they, and of course, Esther's going to, uh, to be able to, you know, with Haman hanging himself, literally and metaphorically, um, is going to be able to take advantage of it and to see that. So let's get to Esther 6 with the time that we've got left and just look at a few things. So really, I know that we look at Esther chapter 4 and verse 13 
is kind of the providential statement of the whole book. Uh, you know, who knows whether you come to the kingdom at such a time as this. I'd actually say that chapter 6 is the providential moment of the book. You got Mordecai who's alluding to it, perhaps. We don't really don't know, but perhaps. Really, all of Esther 6, the reader, we the reader, we got to make a decision. Is everything coincidence? Does the king just happen to not sleep well that night? Do, do, the, do the servants of the king just happen to grab, out of probably hundreds of volumes of chronicles, the chronicle that wrote the story of Mordecai's salvation? That just, that just happened? When the king wants to honor Mordecai, and he just simply asks, hey, who's out in the courtyard? Because just the next person we see, let's, let's just get his opinion. Is it just a coincidence that it's Haman that's in the courtyard? Is it just a coincidence that Haman spends three, four verses, his own pride getting him in the way? Getting, is it just a coincidence with all of this? Or is everything that happens in chapter 6 what we would perhaps call providence? The, the, I, you got a Mordecai that says, who knows whether you've come to a kingdom at such a time as this? And that's true. We don't know this. But we won't know unless you act. But as the reader... You start putting these things together. The, the question that Mordecai asks in chapter 4, the pieces start falling into place in chapter 6. It can't just be a coincidence. But maybe it will. So in verses 2 and 3, the king has a sleepless night. What's read to him? Okay, so it's Chronicles of the King. But specifically the story of the uh, uh, when Mordecai saves his life, it halts uh, an, ass uh, an assassination attempt. So what does the king ask? Isn't that pretty amazing just as a side note? It, he's kind of saved your life, don't know how much time has passed, but at least a year has passed. Maybe, maybe two. And it's just kind of the light bulb comes on and it's like, oh, what? No, just wondering, just asking out loud. But it's kind of... I didn't realize this until 3 a.m. that we may not have done something for him. Maybe we ought to do something for him. Go ahead. Uh, what happened next? Yeah. So, uh, so he asked for that. Um, so what he calls for Haman, and in verses 4 through 9, how does Haman's pride shine through? So he calls in Haman. He tells Haman, hey, I just got this question for you. What should you what should be done for the man in whom the king wants to honor? Never says, it's just a generic. But what what should be done? So what how does Haman's pride shine through? <laughs> okay, so the very first thing, forget, let's before we talk about doing, let's fill in the most important blank. Who is it? And somebody mentioned a minute ago self-centered, I don't know how much more self-centered you could get to just assume that the king is talking about you, but we'll go with it. So he answers the who. So what's left? What, what else does he do? How else does his pride shine through with the details that he gives? Okay, so he wants it for himself. What else? Okay, very grandiose. So what kind of things does he want? What kind of things does he say? Okay, Miss Maybell, ma'am. Okay, so he is in effect with those requests. Stan, go ahead. Here I am, and 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 how again? I know we we know this, but it's just just again to highlight it. How full of yourself do you have to be? I don't want just any robe. I don't want just any horse. I don't want just any honor. I want to be royal. I, second in command, because at the point that's where we seem to be, is not enough. Very quickly. So what is the king telling? <laughs> that's fantastic. I love your idea. Go find Mordecai. 
And what is his reaction? He's sullen, meaning... Yeah, he goes home mourning in some cases. But you're right, he's sullen. And he's got to be the one that... So all this wor- this royal ideas that he had for himself actually is going to go to who's he's made as an arch enemy. And he's got to be the one that parades him. He's got to be the one that leads him. And here's the most amazing thing that's going to be said and it, to me in the whole chapter. Look at verse 13 very quickly. And what is omitted by Haman's wife and what is omitted by his wise men? It's another contrast. Another contrast. I want the royal robe. I want this. Mordecai does it. Fine. Whatever. And he goes right back to who he is. But I, with the little bit of time left, I want you to just think about this for, for just a few minutes with everything that's here. One, it's amazing that the least likely of the people thus far are the ones that are putting the pieces together. The, the wife... And the wise men, who came up with the idea for the gallows to begin with, are actually the ones that are saying, yeah, your your fate has been signed, sealed, and delivered. And I wonder if that's what the, if he carries that with him to the meal in the next chapter. Your fate is done. And isn't that what pride does to us? Isn't that what happens if we allow pride, arrogance? You seal your fate before it even happens. And other people can see it, but never the one with it. Everybody else can see it. Everybody else can see you're walking a path and saying you hit the nail on the head. You're done. You're toast. This isn't going to end well. And everybody's saying it. Everybody's trying to reach. The one who doesn't hear it, and the one who doesn't see it. Even with Miss Carol, with your point, even as sullen as he is, maybe he has an inkling, but it doesn't seem to indicate it. But nonetheless, look at what pride does. It blinds us. It makes us deaf, and it ultimately would be our ruin. And it's the same lesson, but he's going to keep going. He's going to ride this out. And you mentioned this a second ago, what's going to happen? And if you're the reader, things have pivoted. It's going to work out. I just don't know how. And that's where we leave the story. The lesson is yours.